Well, welcome back to the Ironic Protestant Podcast, a bi-weekly show where we strive together for the knowledge of God, his word, and his world through the lens of the classical and confessional Protestant tradition. Uh, on today's episode, our very own Josh is going to give us a crash course in reform prolegomena. Uh, what is it? Why is it necessary for doing theology? And why do you need it? And how uh, the reform prolegomena sets the reformed apart from other Protestant traditions, maybe like Lutheranism and Roman Catholicism. Uh, today's episode is graciously sponsored by the Davin Institute. We'll talk more about our sponsor later on in the episode. So, guys, how's it going? Going good, man. Going good. Yeah. It's good. So we got we got Matthew, our PCA boy from Tampa. Yep. We got Josh, our Dutch Reformed dude here at Reformation Bible College in Sanford. We got Jordan. Yeah. Our, our weird Baptist, our Catholic yes. Baptist, our favorite Baptist, Baptist at Reformation Bible College in Sanford, Florida. And then I am Jonathan, the, the Anglican, uh, the Reformation Bible College. Yeah, okay. So, guys, before we get started today, you know, I just had a very mystical experience um, just half an hour before we started recording. I wanted to share with you and then to give a prompting question based off of that. So, um, earlier today, this morning, I woke up with my wife, and we decided to go to the farmer's market here in town. Pretty pretty bougie, you know? It's kind of like doing the married life thing, get a little basket at the farmer's market. Yeah. Went to the, we bought some, bought some fresh lettuce, some nice strawberries, some nice cucumbers, and, like, farm-grown, like, high-quality bacon um, and yeah. rye bread. And then tonight, you know, my wife's out at work, so I was like, man, I need to make food for myself. So I toasted that rye bread and put like a nice lemon garlic aioli on the bottom half and mayo on the other half, a nice crisp lettuce. Um, and I didn't make a BLT. I made a BLC, bacon, lettuce, cucumber. And so I made, cooked up the bacon and I sliced the cucumber real thin. And I bit into that sandwich and I found mm. the best sandwich I ever made. So guys, what, mm. what's the best sandwich that you've ever made? Who wants to go first? I, I'll take it. So, unfortunately, this is neither the best sandwich I've ever made, nor is it one that I've actually made. But it's just going to – I'll give my old uh, pub <coughs> sub order that I used to get. So, if you're not in Florida or in some other places in the South, you might not know, but Publix is a great grocery store, and they make delicious subs. And right now, what I usually get is a buffalo chicken tender sub, and it's great. But let me, <laughs> let me tell you about the sub I used to get when I was, like, in middle school. I used to get – you know, bread, and it would have roast beef on it, buffalo sauce, guacamole, mayo, and then lettuce and spinach. And every time I had it made, the people making it would laugh at me because yeah, they never I'm, thought that I'm anybody, trying not to right now. <laughs> they never thought that anybody would have roast beef, guacamole, mayo, and uh, what was I? What was it? Guacamole, roast beef. Buffalo and mayo, yeah. So it's just a very strange combination. But yeah, that's just what I used to get. Matthew, are you able to create yeah. your own sandwich? Are, are you able, able to, to make your own, own sandwich? sandwich? My mom usually makes my sandwiches. Okay. But I sometimes make them because sometimes I just want to make my own sandwich because I just don't feel like waiting or something. But yeah, my lovely mother makes a mean sandwich. So, And she, don't usually, hey she doesn't usually cook. It's usually my dad just grilling or something, but she makes a mean sandwich. Yeah, Josh, what's the best sandwich you've ever made? Man, um, I think maybe uh, a couple of years ago, um, I think I was just coming home from baseball practice and wasn't particularly a great cook at the time, but I chefed up a good teriyaki chicken sandwich um, with lettuce, tomatoes, no mayo. I'm not a big mayo guy. I do not like mayo. Um, but yeah, I think it was the best sandwich that I had. I, I felt very accomplished because I didn't know how to cook and I was able to make a chicken teriyaki sandwich. Yeah. Oh. Jordan, we, actually guys, Jordan makes sandwiches. It's his thing. Yeah. That's, that's his thing now. I, um, I make sandwiches, but I never made a sandwich ever in my life for myself. That's how humble I am. Uh, yeah. but I, um, I honestly can't think of a of a sandwich I've made for myself, but 
if I could change the question a little bit just to what sandwich would I want made for myself right now is I just really want a <laughs> a Popeye's spicy chicken sandwich. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, <laughs> that's really Jordan's staple. I'm not going to pay for <laughs> it's definitely good. I remember when people were thinking that Popeye's was going to be a, you know, a thorn in the side of Chick-fil-A, but yeah, well, you guys know, that's not happening. like with the sandwich, just like anything, you have to have some like prior knowledge of how to make a sandwich before you make a sandwich. You can call it sandwich prolegomena. Understand the first Ooh. principles of sandwich making where you need, you need to have two pieces of bread and something in between the bread for it to qualify as a sandwich. Mm. So that's my, like that's this. my piecemeal segue. Uh, into Joshua. Joshua, what is prolegomena and why do we need it? Yeah, man. Before I get into that, I would like to like recommend uh, several books that were pretty influential on me in preparing for this topic and just my development as a student of, you know, God's word, uh, you know, and also just someone who is in reception of the great theological tradition that the Reformed tradition has to offer. The number one uh, work that I want to re recommend, um, this is not in like, what are my favorites, but um, I'll just go from what is more comprehensive. Um, Franciscus Unius's Treatise on True Theology truly was the standard reform prolegomena from, you know, the beginning of the 17th century onward. Um, Franciscus Unius was born in 1545 um, in France, and he studied at Geneva under Theodore Beza. Um, he got to Geneva at not necessarily an awkward time, but towards the latter end of Calvin's life and wasn't able to correspond much with Calvin. But Franciscus Unius's prolegomen on true theology really in just its order of teaching and the content laid in it is really just a, what a standard reform prolegomena is. And another work that I'm going to recommend um, uh, the Light and Synopsis of Pure Theology, um, the first disputation in this um, um, synopsis of theology was presided over by Johannes Polyander, who was influenced by Franciscus Unius. Some information about the synopsis of Pure Theology, it's a compilation of disputations from the 1625 theological faculty at Leiden. Um, the four professors that were presiding over these disputations were Johannes Polyander, Andre Reve, Antoine Willeus, and Antonio Spicius, which were all delegates at the National Senate of Dort. But the synopsis, the synopsis of pure theology is by far one of the greatest reform textbooks that I've ever read. Um, its disputation on sacred theology is amazing. It's very concise. Um, it's not long-winded. And if it wasn't $165, I would say everyone needs to get it. But you know, I was just about to ask about that. It's <laughs> I was looking at it the other day. It's pricey. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's well, you know, pricey. Michael Lynch said they're actually releasing a, a cheaper. Someone's producing a cheaper paperback mm -hmm. version without the Latin. It's going to be a lot cheaper. So that's yeah. going to be a great resource yeah. when it comes out. Yeah, it's great. Um, I just I appreciate, you know, everything that, you know, disputation number one has to say about sacred theology it really just really sets up for, you know, each locus. It's like you have to read everything that you read in the synopsis in light of what was said in disputation number one. Um, but that's that. Um, the third work that I want to recommend is Maastricht's Prolegomena, um, his theoretical practical theology, which is, it's amazing. It's, uh, you know, just the name of, you know, his work, theoretical practical theology, just embodies the reform's understanding of the nature of sacred theology. Yeah, Maastricht is, you know, he was born in the 17th century in Cologne, Germany. Um, his family moved from Cologne to a Dutch refugee congregation in the Netherlands, where Johannes Hornbeck, someone who influenced him to write the theoretical practical theology, was the pastor. Um, he would then um, study at the Theological School of Utrecht under a great Dutch divine, Heisbertus Vutius, and then he moved there from to Leiden, and then he would serve till the end of his life at the University of Utrecht. Um, but Maastricht is a great divine. Um, his just his treatment on Prolegomena, the Doctrine of God, Volume Two, which was translated by Todd Rester, and um, Volume One was translated by Todd Rester as well. Just an amazing treatment on this, you know, the locus of God. 
Um, and volume three just came out. Um, I was able to get one a couple of weeks ago and I've, I've been enjoying it on, you know, the works of God and the fall of man. Um, but Maastricht is an amazing Dutch divine and I'm glad that it's available to the English um, in America. And then the final work, um, which is just an amazing, you know, this is something which was a standard divinity, divinity textbook for theology students, The Mirror of True Theology by William Ames. Um, if you read Maastricht's Prolegomena, you'll see Ames' influence, not only in his Prolegomena, but especially if you get to volume two um, on saving faith, um, on, you know, on proofs for God's existence, and on the attributes of God. Maastricht is heavily influenced by the English Puritan William Ames, who taught at a Dutch university, the University of Franeker. William Ames in his Mayor of, the, of True Theology, um, he says that the definition of theology is the art of living to God. And I'll just show you the influence that Maastricht has, that Ames has on Maastricht. Maastricht writes that the art of theology, that the definition of theology is the art of living to God through Christ. So obviously you see the influence between Ames and Maastricht. And, you know, something that I appreciate about these just standard divinity textbooks is that they're very concise. You know, they're written in a manner that theological students are able to understand and remember. And I think that's the way that theology handbooks and theology manuals should be written in a concise manner so that our divinity students may comprehend, um, you know, the subject of sacred theology. But those are the books that I have to recommend. They're great books, heavily influential on me and just influential in general in the Reformed tradition. But I guess I'll just, do you have a question, Jonathan? Yeah, I was going to say, I, 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 okay. two things real quick. Um, one is, I mean, I mean, I also would highly recommend Ben Maastricht, anybody listening at home, if you're new to prolegomena. And we're defining prolegomena means here in a second, right, Josh? Yep. Um, uh, we use prolegomena, uh, Ben Maastricht's prolegomena here at Reformation Bible College. And it's a book that was really influential to me in coming in because I had really no method of theology and I needed to be taught how to do theology. Mm -hmm. um, and then also being taught that theology is both theoretical, it's a knowledge thing, but it's also a practical thing. It's something we do, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and the way Ben Mostrick sets up his whole systematic theology is super easy to understand. Each chapter is starts at the exegetical part. Then it goes to the dogmatic part, and the elenctic part where he defends his theology against naysayers. Mm -hmm. And then he always ends each chapter of theology with a practical part. And so this, this theology is, is very, very devotional as you read it. And you, you, you always answer the question, why is this important? Why does this matter for the Christian life? So if you're at home looking for a systematic theology, don't go to Wayne Grudem. Go to Van Maastricht. Mm -hmm. um, and also, Josh, when you talk about divinity students, um, some people, you know, we're used to hearing like Bible college students, theology students. When you, when you say divinity student, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, when you go back to the 16th and 17th century, um, especially if you read, you know, I mentioned, you know, sacred theology, you know, you know, this sacred language, um, the way that, you know, a minister was understood, you know, prior to becoming and, you know, being called, you know, we distinguish between the internal call and external call. Prior to that, the minister is a divinity student. He is a subject of, he is a student of divine things. And that kind of really segues in into like everything that prolegomena is going to treat, you know, divinity coming from the word divine, obviously just means that he is a student of divine things, a student of God's word. That's what we mean when we say divinity students. But can I jump in? No. Oh. All right. So prolegomena, it's, it's, you know, just talking to my friends, it's a, you know, sometimes a word that's hard to pronounce, you know, prolegomena, you know. Prolegomena, there you go. And what prolegomena means is, you know, things said prior. And these things said prior are first principles that are necessary prior to treating this specific science. So when we talk about prolegomena, it's not only, prolegomena doesn't only have in mind, you know, sacred theology, Christian doctrine, you know, systematic theology every science and we'll go into why theology is called a science but every science you know every proper science has its own prolegomena you know biology you know it's a science it has its own prolegomena you know these things it's it's kind of like 
a manual of like, okay, these are the things that you have to know prior to jumping into something, right? You know, if you look at human experience, when we jump into things that we have no experience of, we have bad outcomes. And that's something that I'll be arguing, you know, during this podcast is that, you know, something that I firmly believe, um, and, you know, you brothers can challenge it, challenge me on it if you don't, if you don't agree, but I believe that every theological heresy, heterodoxy can be traced back to a bad prolegomena. Um, and I firmly believe that. And that just shows just how passionate I am about prolegomena. And really it's necessity before, you know, for all divinity students, all, all people who want to do, you know, reveal theology to have a good prolegomena. But yeah, prolegomena, the definition of prolegomena means things said prior. As I said, each science has its own prolegomena. And I guess I'll just go through the history of prolegomena. You know, Thomas Aquinas has, you know, one question, one article, I'm sorry, um, devoted to sacred theology, you know, sacred doctrine. And that's that would be Thomas's prolegomena. Um, Thomas in his prolegomena, he argues that theology is strictly a theoretical habit. And, you know, to those who are trained in the Reformed tradition, you know, as Jonathan just said prior, we say that theology is theoretical and practical. Now, the reason why Aquinas comes to this position is Aquinas's position on the beatific vision, right? For Aquinas, salvation consists of the most perfect contemplation of God, right? This, these were big debates that happened in the high medieval tradition between Thomas and the Scotus, whether vision consisted of enjoyment or just merely knowledge. Um, the reform will merge both of them and say that vision and, and consist of both knowledge and enjoyment. But the reason why the Thomists and the Dominicans are going to say that theology is strictly a theoretical habit is because of their view of salvation, that it consists of the most perfect contemplation of God. Um, then from there, obviously, even though that uh, even though that the reform depart from Aquinas's understanding of the habit of theology, the reform will pick up, you know, especially Unius in his treatise on true theology, Maastricht as well. If you read it, um, Maastricht quotes Thomas and, Squ and, and Scotus in his um, treatise in, in his theoretical practical theology. So obviously Maastricht is building on the high medieval tradition, but Calvin also has a prolongamina. It's not as comprehensive as, you, as you're gonna see in the 16th and as you're gonna see in the 17th century. And, but you can also say in the 16th because um, uh, Unius's treatise on true theology was published in 1590. Um, so Unius would be considered an early Orthodox theologian. Um, but I, I believe the most comprehensive view is what you see in Unius and also in the, the line and synopsis. So Calvin also has a prolegomena, but it's not as extensive as later theologians. And I think that has to do with, you know, Calvin's intention on writing his Institutes of the Christian Religion. But you have every standard divinity textbook is going to have a prolegomena. I can't really think of one. I can think of a modern one. You know, Robert Lethem, his systematic theology does not have a prolegomena, you know, and I think it's reflective of our times. I think it's very reflective of our modern times. I think, of, I think and that's why people, not necessarily saying Lethem does this, but people who come to bad theological positions, I think it's because their lack of prolegomena. But the basic structure, and I won't read it out, I'll just cover each point. The basic structure of a reformed prolegomena, the first question, especially if we're endeavoring the science of sacred theology, is whether true theology exists. Um, you know, that's a question, that's the first question in Franciscus Unius' treatise on true theology. Franciscus Unius, when he writes the treatise on true theology, He's answering 32 theses, um, and one of them is, you know, whether true theology exists. And we make the argument that true theology exists because God has revealed himself, right? Theology can be derived from the goodness of God, the nature of God, and therefore, since it is the study of God, we can say that true theology exists. Having established that, what is theology, right? There's various conceptions and definitions of what theology is, but um, what Unius will borrow from in, in uh, Augustine's City of God, book eight, I think it's, I think it's section one of um, Augustine's City of God. Um, 
Unius will borrow from Augustine's City of God and say that theology is the discourse or the you know wisdom concerning divine matters. There's various definitions on what theology is. I heard one that you know when people ask me what theology is, I I I can't. I think it might be Turretin who says this. I thought it was Thomas, but then I had to reread the Summa. It's not Thomas. Um, but the definition that I particularly like on the definition of theology is the study of God and all things in relation to God. Um, if you guys know where that's from, you guys can chip in, but I wasn't able to find it. I'm assuming that it was Turretin, but um, that's the definition that I like. Um, I can look at, um, but there's, there's various definitions and all of them are going to be pretty consistent. Theology is wisdom concerning divine matters. That's what Unius says. Um, and the definition that I rely on is theology is the study of God and all things in relation to God. And then when we talk about theology, we distinguish between the parts that belong to sacred theology. And, and this is, I guess, where we'll camp for, I guess, maybe 10 or five minutes. Um, we just, especially when we're talking about theology, theology, of course, is knowledge. And the modes of knowledge that we distinguish between is archetypal and archetypal theology. You know, to those who are not from the Reformed tradition, um, archetypal and archetypal theology might be something that you've never heard of before. I remember when I first read that, I was like, what is this? Um, so archetypal theology refers to the theology that God has in and of himself, right? This theology is not created. This theology is belonging to the divine Eusea. You know, it's a simple, uncompounded knowledge. It's an immutable knowledge, a perfect knowledge. And then also, and then ectypal theology would not necessarily be the contrary to that, but it would be created theology. Theology communicated to human beings. It's finite. It's still wisdom concerning divine matters, but there's a distinction in our modes of knowing, right? I only know via the divine ectype, the divine ectype modeling after the archetype, God knows not, you know, from somebody else, but he knows all things in and of himself. And I think I'll just, I'll, I'll talk about this because I was talking to, uh, I mentioned it before on how every theological problem can be traced to a bad prolegomena. When we talk about Socinianism and, you know, their anti-Trinitarianism, when we talk about, you know, rationalistic theologians, you know, especially people denying, you know, the Trinity, you know, the Trinity doesn't make any sense, you know, stuff like this, especially like, especially modern issues like the doctrine of divine simplicity, you know, James Dozal in his book, All That Is in God, he treats a lot of theologians who have, de who have denied the classical attribute of simplicity. And to some, it's, you know, this doesn't make sense, you know, how can you say we cannot make any distinctions in God? And I think, especially when you read the Reformed on distinctions, whether it's formal, rational, modal, a real distinction, I think just knowing that solves that problem. But, you know, the reason why this question is asked, especially when we talk about, you know, something like the Holy Trinity, how we can conceive of one God in three persons, you know, it's something that, you know, doesn't necessarily contradict reason, but it surpasses reason. You know, nature is not in conflict with grace. Um, but grace does surpass nature. So when you don't have that distinction between archetypal and archetypal theology, you're going to have rationalistic tendencies, especially when you treat our purest articles, especially like the Most Holy Trinity and the Incarnation. Like, how, how can we conceive of the Incarnation? Because there's nothing in nature that is like it. And I think that's, that's, where, that's where we're forced into humility, you know, especially as Christian theologians, divinity students, we have to understand that on, on this side of glory and even the next, you know, we will never comprehend God as he comprehends himself. And, you know, there's, that's just that Augustinian tradition of mystery leading the children of God to worship. You know, we have to acknowledge divine mysteries, but we also have to understand that the Holy Trinity is a divine mystery, but it is revealed in scripture. So therefore it can be argued for and defended against those who do polemics against it. But those are the parts of theology. And when we talk about archetypal theology, there's no genus in archetypal theology. Genus is just an Aristotelian category. And I'll get into why Aristotelian categories are used in prolegomena, but 
in archetypal theology, there is no genus. It's just God's knowledge of himself. But when treating ectypal theology, when we talk about the genus of ectypal theology, the first knowledge that we treat is the theology of Christ. And this has to do with the theology conferred to the mediator. Um, and the reason why this is the highest theology on the genus of ectypal theology, because it is the closest theology that models the divine archetype, especially when we talk about the mediator and the union of two natures, obviously Christ being the God man, the theology conferred to his human nature because of the union of the two natures are obviously it's going to model and you know just the radiance of Christ's knowledge as the second person of the trinity is going to be conferred you know it, not necessarily conferred but the radiance is going to you know i'm trying to look for a word um i'm trying to look for a word to say mm. anyways i don't want to say i don't want to say the, the 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 divine archetype is communicated to the human nature because that would be getting into you know do you want to say something jonathan Right. I think what we're trying to say, though, is that Christ's knowledge of God, because he's both God and man, right? So the human nature of Christ has a mm -hmm. knowledge of God that is as perfect, right, as yeah. full as a human nature is capable of knowing God. So yeah. the ectypal theology of Christ's mm -hmm. human nature is like the highest ectypal theology. So we're talking about the yeah. theology that Christ has as the God-man. Um, yeah. So is human nature that's what you're trying to say right? mm -hmm. yeah yeah and the reason why and a couple by way of preface what the reformed wouldn't say is that you know especially when you read i i don't know like i would have to reread the summa but especially roman catholics at the time when we because when doing prolegomena you know roman catholics have prolegomenas as well they would say that the theology that jesus has in his human nature is the theology of the blessed right the beatific vision and we wouldn't say that we would say now as christ has ascended to the right hand of the father yes he has you know the theology of the blessed you know or theologia uh, beatorum but we would say you know when we talk about the theology conferred to his human nature in the incarnation it is the highest archetypal theology because it is closest to divine it is closest to divine archetype but we would acknowledge, and this, this segues into the next, the next, uh, you know, mode of knowing the theology of the blessed, right? Um, so when we talk about archetypal theology, it's divided between theology of union and then theology of the blessed. So the theology of the blessed is the theology of those who behold God face to face, right? And Franciscus Unius gets on this in his uh, treatise on true theology that it's perfection. Right? When we talk about, because usually. Reformed theologians will say that it is perfect theology. Now, when we when we think of perfect, you know, it's like, didn't you just say that there's a distinction between archetypal and ectypal? So are you saying that the theology of those blessed in the heaven, like, you know, St. Paul or, you know, St. John, are you saying that they have divine archetype knowledge? And this is something that Francis Junius, he only spends, I think, five pages on, but it's something that he spends out in brief, but all the distinctions that you need to know are made present in, in Eunice's treatise on true theology. The reason why we say the theology of the blessed is perfect has to do with their location, not necessarily that there's a univocal genus between God's knowledge and our knowledge, right? It's only analogical. So it's not as if when I die and I go into glory, you know, the knowledge that I have, which is, you know, classified as the knowledge of the blessed, somehow becomes God's divine archetype knowledge. The only reason why it's called perfect is because it's location. It's seeing God and we're beholding God face to face, seeing him as he is. So that's a distinction that you want to have in mind because especially when we talk about the theology of the blessed, you know, people can say, okay, I have perfect theology, you know, but we're not saying that, you know, people who go into glory somehow receive the divine knowledge that God has of, of, in it of himself, that is uncreated, immutable, unchangeable, et cetera. Um, but the reason why it's perfect is because it's location, it's in the blessed in heaven. So, and then the final 
So it's something, this is something that Unius acknowledges that Jesus sanctified both the theology of the blessed and the theology in this life. So this is the theology that we have, right? The theology, it's usually called theologia revelata, you know, reveal theology, the theology in this life that is revealed to us pilgrims. So Jesus, obviously in his humiliation, you know, he went through the theology of this life, but obviously in his, in, in his uh, ascension, he received the theology of the blessed. And something that we want to acknowledge is that Although there's a genus of ectypal theology, this does not take away from the validity of the theology of union, the theology of the blessed, and also the theology in this life. The reason why we're categorizing them is just to distinguish and emphasize that there is a difference, and we want to acknowledge those differences, especially when we talk about the theology of union, right? I think the theology of union, and Unius gets on this in brief, but he's not doing Christology, but it's something that's going to influence your Christology and this goes back to the point that I was making, that your prolegomena influences how you treat every theological topic, right? If you don't have a theology of union and you say that the knowledge that the mediator has, right, in his human nature is God's simple and uncompounded knowledge, you know, you have the Lutheran error on the communication of attributes. So that's, and, and that just, it shows you the practicality because, you know, as I said, theology is theoretical and practical. We want to believe that which is right so that we can worship God in spirit and the truth. But having treated the theology of union, the theology of the blessed, and now we have the theology revealed in this life. And that's the theology that we have in nature and in scripture. Um, ectypal theology can be divided between natural and supernatural theology. Um, natural theology, its principle is nature. It's that which is revealed in nature and reason, you know, whether it's innate ideas, you know, that which is, you know, written on the hearts of man, you know, God's law, Romans 2.15, or God's attributes, you know, Romans 1. Um, and then supernatural theology is, you know, where is the principle of sacred theology, the principle of doing theology. Um, and in supernatural theology is revealed divine mysteries, divine wisdom, um, concerning it further explains or reveals that which is not revealed in nature. For example, um, a distinction that we make in prolegomena is between pure and mixed articles. And this is, you know, very important when we talk about apologetic methods, right? Mixed articles are that which is revealed in nature and scripture, such as the justice of God, right? God's justice is shown to us in the cross in Jesus Christ, but it's also shown to us in nature, you know? God is, you know, the fountain of all good and an extension of his goodness is his justice. And therefore, since we violate God's law, something that's also revealed in nature and in scripture, God will punish those who violate his law. And something that would belong to the pure articles are such as the Holy Trinity. You know, there's nothing in nature that can resemble God's triunity, you know one essence, three persons. There's nothing. The incarnation, you know, the union of two natures, the hypostatic union, all of these are pure articles that are only revealed in supernatural revelation. Do you guys have any questions before I treat each one and continue? Uh, so yeah, treat each I wanted... Brad Matthews. Me, I'll go. Um, so I actually was, um, I was curious about this because like, you said a lot of words and there were a lot of big words and they were good words. They were good. It was good stuff, but they were large words. So if you were to like get like a little note card and you could like give me little definitions, I wanted to really quick ask you. So I already know prolegomena, the way you defined it is things said prior. That was pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But can you like real quick? I know it's hard because there's a lot of like depth to it and all that, especially with like sure. how like, you know, with ectypal, there's natural theology and supernatural theology and it keeps going. But I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could like, just in a nutshell, tell me, like, in a sentence, what archetypal theology is and then what ectypal is. Sure. And give us, give us an example. Okay. So archetypal theology is the theology that is uncreated, you know, infinite that God has of himself. Ectypal theology would be the theology communicated to creatures in this life whether it is, you know, to the mediator, to the blessed in heaven, or 
the theology revealed in this life, whether natural or supernatural. And yeah, the example of archetypal would be, you know, the divine knowledge, you know, it is, you know, we only know by analysis, God knows, you know, we only know things when they, you know, come to our senses and we comprehend them by our intellect, you know, God does not have senses, you know, of course, God has intellect, um, but God does not, you know, know the way that we know. Um, knowledge in God and in us only agree analogically and not univocally. Um, and the next type of knowledge would be, you know, the knowledge that we have in scripture or in nature, right? When, when doing natural theology, um, that would be an example of ectypal theology. Uh, okay. I'm glad well, you summarized that because, um, sorry, I'll let you go. I'm just going to make a really quick comment. Cause when you were like, when you mentioned like Turretin, my, I, my mm -hmm. ADHD brain got distracted and I wanted to get Turretin to see if like, you're like what you were summarizing was like, um, cause you were wondering if that was what he was saying. So I got mm -hmm. a little distracted and then I completely yeah. lost the archetypal and ectypal. I was piecing it together, but yeah. So thanks for that. Sorry, Jonathan, what were you about to say? Yeah, Josh, just to kind of like, but bring down what you're trying to say and even like more, just like sure. quick, easy memory. Would you say it, it, archetypal, ectypal theology is simply this distinction that like me as a creature, I can't know God fully, but I yeah. can know him truly, right? Yeah. God fully knows himself to the furthest infinite extent, but I mm -hmm. can't know God fully because I'm finite, but I can know true things about God. Yeah. Is that is that a good way to summarize what you're saying mm -hmm. about archetypal and ectypal theology? Yeah, I think that's a great way. And that's that's something that's brought up a lot on, you know, concerning the existence of God and the knowledge of God, because those two things, when we talk about doctrine of God, those two things are treated together, the existence and knowledge of God. And something that Master brings up in his volume two is whether we can give a definition of God. And Master says no, right? A definition presupposes absolute comprehension, um, but we can give a description of God. And this is, and this goes back to the, the the language that I've been using between analogical, univocal. You you know everything that we say about God is analogical, given the fact that the principle of theology is supernatural theology, which is ectypal theology. Um, since it is created, since it is not infinite, as God has you know knowledge in and of Himself. Obviously, everything we're going to say about God is analogical, but that does not necessitate what we say about God is false. What we say about God is true, even though we say it analogically. So we can never speak about God univocally, right? Because that presupposes that there's an app, you know, that we have the divine archetype. But we can speak about God analogically. And this is something that Thomas gets at in his Summa. But yeah. And then one more thing, just to clarify, when you say, just to give, when you say prolegomenous things prior, you're referring to um, things that need to be known prior yeah. to doing a thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, it's things that you can go through. You know, any science that you want, whether it's history, right? There's just certain principles that you need to know prior to doing history. There's just certain principles, especially, and this is something I want to emphasize. Just I guess a practical part is um when we're talking about doing theology and right of course we're receiving what god has revealed and we're trying to i, I just love the definition that bavin gives in his prolegomena that you know the task of the dogmatician the task of the doctor of sacred theology you might say is to think god's thoughts after himself and to trace their unity that's beautiful right so when doing theology, right, if there are those who, you know, desire to be doctors of the church, to be theologians in seminaries, and I think it's even necessary for those who want to preach God's word, those who are called to holy ministry. Um, our, our job, you know, me, myself, who wants to go into theological ministry, our job is to not necessarily say something new, but to think God's thoughts after himself which is communicated to us in Holy Scripture and trace their unity, right? When we talk about there's different kinds of theology, as I've mentioned, the theology of vision, the theology of the blessed and the theology communicated to us in this life. But overarching that, there's a divine unity, right? And the divine unity of all of this theology exists formally, right? In God's essence, right? There's a unity since God is one, 
obviously, even though there's distinctions amongst, you know, our modes of knowing, ectypal and archetypal, there's a unity behind our theology. Um, so that's that's our role as theologians. Um, that's our role as, you know, ministers um, to reproduce what God has said um, and do it faithfully. And, and then, Josh, we're, we're nearing the 40-minute uh, mark. So I know you okay. have some more material. Could you, could yeah. you, uh, could you go and wrap us up in about five minutes, get, get and finish off the material, and that way we can brief word from our sponsor and begin uh, sure. discussion time? Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about just two things, I guess. I think two things. Um, two things um, is theoretical habits. You know, I mentioned the word habits and wisdom, and but this is something that theologians ask in their prolegomena is, you know, to what habit does theology belong to? And this is something that the Reformed tradition has acknowledged that when we're talking about habits, I guess by way of preface, is we're talking about, you know, the intellectual habits that Aristotle makes in his Nicomachean Ethics. Um, and somewhere, you know, Aristotle not only used his Nicomachean Ethics and not only used in you know, the reforms treatment on the system of virtues. But I think from my reading, I could be wrong on this, but where I see a lot of Aristotelian language is in reform prolegomena. Um, so when we talk about, you know, to what habit does theology belong to, this is something that Turretin acknowledges in his Institutes of Electic Theology. Maastricht also acknowledges, but Unius, um, he doesn't treat it. And I don't think uh, Johannes Polyander in the Synopsis treats it as well, but they just, they say that theology is wisdom, right? You know, when we talk about Aristotle's habits, you know, theology cannot, you know, properly speaking, reflect any of them because they are, you know, theology is not the art of knowing, but the art of believing, right? These are intellectual habits. The theology is not the art of knowing, it's the art of believing. So properly, it cannot belong to any of the five, you know, Aristotelian intellectual habits. But something that Turretin acknowledges is that it imminently embraces all of them. But strictly speaking, we will say that theology or the genus of theology is theoretical and practical. Um, it is theoretical, it is knowledge leading to practice, right? It is not strictly theoretical as Thomas and the Dominicans say, it is not strictly practical as the Scotus say. Um, it is it is both theoretical and practical. Those two things are organically linked together. Um, and that's how we ought to do theology so that we can honor what God has revealed. Um, and usually I'll just bring this up in brief. And this, this goes back to just the use of Aristotle and prolegomena. Um, something that Unius does towards the end of his work is that he distinguishes between the efficient cause of theology. He distinguishes between the principle of theology being, you know, um, God revealing himself, right? You know, Principia Mascendi. This is just, you know, terms that are used in our prolegomena and also the instrumental cause of theology. So God is the efficient cause of theology. God reveals himself, willingly chose to reveal himself. And the instrumental cause of our theology are the Holy Scriptures. Um, and he also talks about the material cause of our theology, which is divine matters and the formal cause, which is divine truth. And yeah, that's that's the basic sum of it. Um, prolegomena is necessary to, you know, treating the doctrine of God, you know, the doctrine of scripture, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of the church. The distinctions that you make in prolegomena are going to come to bear in, you know, your treatment of each locus. It's going to be there, especially, I see it the most in our, uh, in our doctrine of God, especially when we're, you know, God is incomprehensible. You know, how can we talk about God who is incomprehensible? So having those distinctions are going to be very helpful and they're going to be very clarifying. And they're going to actually, they're going to help you to do theology in an organic way, um, in a way that's honoring to God and a way that guards from error. But yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. Well, is that, is that all for me, Josh, on Prolegomena? Yes, sir. Okay, so for our live audience here on YouTube, if you have any questions uh, for Josh or for any of us to discuss regarding uh, Reformed uh, Protestant Prolegomena, please uh, just throw it down in, in the chat section. Uh, and now uh, a brief word from our sponsor. 
Um, so guys, let me ask you a question. Do y'all do y'all like listening to theology podcast? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. I'm guessing everybody at home loves listening to theology podcasts, right? I'm at home. Just think, if you enjoy podcasts about theology and the Christian tradition, we wish you had some place to take your deeper questions. Um, we suggest you head over to Davenant Hall, uh, where they uh, advance and renew classical wisdom in this digital age. Um, they're offering a course, the Aristotle Seminar. And in this course, uh, this course is a direct engagement with the works of Aristotle with an eye for how his thought has influenced the Christian tradition. Uh, this uh, term in the seminar will engage his works on ethics, psychology, phenomenology. Psychology and phenomenology are studies first and foremost of what we are as inquirers. Philosophy is never fully abstracted from the philosopher and the philosophical inquiry is never fully divorced from the all too human quest for self-knowledge. Acquiring the grammar of Aristotle's method and the language of his discourse Students will address fundamental questions of ethics, metaphysics, phenomenology, but through the lens of Aristotle. Um, this course uh, will be every week, and it'll be uh, two hours per week uh, on Zoom, and it'll be live instruction. Uh, but if you enroll, you can also listen and download um, the, the, um, the lectures later. And the cost to audit is $149, and it begins on April 11th, and it goes through June 17th. Uh, and registration is open until the end of March, so you should get your butt over there and register. Uh, and if Aristotle is not your thing, you can check out other thing, things that uh, Davenant offers at davenanthall.com. Uh, Davenant Hall is the only master's program we know of. For once you complete the degree, if you go on to finish an approved PhD within a decade, they'll actually refund your full tuition. At other schools, they make you pay for it. At Davenant, wisdom sets the student free. Um, from ancient languages... To in-depth studies of great thinkers, Davenant Hall is a refounding of the ancient university for the digital frontier. So, guys, we highly suggest you go check out Davenant Hall. They have great faculty, great, great instructors, and it's the place right now where classical Protestantism and confessional Protestantism is being rediscovered and reappropriated, um, and we're really excited for what they're doing over there. Uh, so that's the word from our sponsor, Davenant Hall, um, done by the Davenant Institute. So now we're going to uh, transition into our time of discussion. Um, so let's see. Any? There's no questions in the chat so far. Can um, I ask so I question, like to... another question? Yes. Go ahead, Matthew. Okay. So I really enjoy that the um, with the Davenant sponsor that you brought up the Aristotle course because something that I noticed in um in Joshua and your uh, going on about um prolegomena was you mentioned how the genus of theology is theoretical and practical. You talked about the four Aristotelian causes of like theology, like the efficient cause, formal cause, material cause, and things like that. And I was just wondering, I if you're not a theology student, you might not know what those things are. So I was just wondering if you could quickly just define what genus means in regard to Aristotelian terms. And then also, can you like just briefly say like what the four Aristotelian causes mean so that people who like were listening and haven't taken like an Aristotle course, but they should at Davenant Hall, but just to get yeah. a good taste, <laughs> uh, just to uh, get something from you. Yeah, I can do that. And something that, you know, even though prolegomena, it's, it's not necessarily meant to be concise, but um, it is meant to just establish, you know, your treatment of each locus. You know, something that Turretin asks in his prolegomena is whether, you know, philosophy is valid. You know, can philosophy be used? Um, and, you know, Turretin distinguishes between, you know, reason as a source of theology, which we would deny. You know, reason is not the source of supernatural theology. Um, and um, reason as a, you know, aid. Usually, you know, when we talk about philosophy, it serves as a handmaid into theology. But yeah, genus, um, when we talk about genus, we're just talking about, you know, so something that Thomas says is that in his treatment on simplicity is like, is whether, whether God is in a genus. And that, you know, when we talk about genus is we're talking about a created category. You know, I would be under, you know, the genus of man. Right. You know, you and I, you know, everybody here who is a rational creature, we share, we, you know, we're share in the same genus. Um, and that it would just be, it would be one of the Aristotelian categories to just label, um, you know, to distinguish 
between species, um, um, and and that's why that's why genus is used in prolegomena to distinguish between ectypal and archetypal. Um, there's no there's not a genus between ectypal and archetypal because they differ they differ from each other. Um, but in ectypal theology itself, there's a genus because they differ from each other, you know, formally, um, but they're all valid, they are all true, <clears throat> and they all belong under ectypal theology. And then the four causes, um, our, our professor at, the, uh, at, a, at Reformation Bible College usually gives this example, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but um, so when my, so he's, he's lecturing on a podium, right, and you know, the efficient cause of the podium would be the person who made it. Um, the material cause would be the wood, the formal cause would be the form, and then the final cause would be that end by which, you know, it was made for, to lecture on. Um, and the re you know, we see Aristotle's categories used a lot, especially in our locus of salvation, um, and especially on the doctrine of God, when we talk about predestination, providence, um, the decree, reprobation, um, there's heavy use amongst the Reformed Orthodox on Aristotle's four causes. But yeah, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Thanks I, for that. Josh, um, on that note, with the Reformed tradition using Aristotelian terminology quite often, mm -hmm. why, why Aristotelian terminology? Sure. Why not like some modern philosopher or you know anyone else like why aristotle yeah why are you mixing mm -hmm. uh, philosophy with uh the vain traditions of men with theology come on yeah that's uh that's a good question um i i guess i would make it like more practical because i know you know just being friends with you guys you guys are people who enjoy you know plato right plato's great you know we love plato right but you, you know <laughs> i do i love plato <laughs> have his dialogues back home. Um, but I think, and I've been talking about this a lot with my friend. Um, we have, you know, our particular friend, James Derryberry, I'll give him a shout out. Um, but the reason why Aristotle, especially like, you know, not, I don't want to, I don't, I, I do not believe that there's an antithesis between Plato and Aristotle. Um, but the reason why Aristotle is used frequently in, you know, the periods of orthodoxy, especially when you have the early high medieval, when these Latin translations of Aristotle were made available to you know the medievals, the reason why Aristotle was used is because Aristotle is writing a system of philosophy, and the distinctions and formulations that he gives in the categories, you know, the Nicomachean Ethics, um, you know, all his philosophical works, um, you know, physics, metaphysics, etc. Um, those distinctions are clear, you know on interpretation, et cetera, the distinctions that he makes are clear and are helpful, especially the distinctions that he makes in metaphysics and physics, the distinctions between act and potency, his intellectual habits, um, his four causes, these are clear. And, you know, especially Thomas Aquinas, who, you know, always quotes Aristotle, right? You know, the philosopher says, you know, that's a constant, you know, theme that you see in Thomas's Summa Theologica, the reason why Thomas is doing this, you know, you know, said contra, contrary to this modern idea that <clears throat> Thomas is trying to merge philosophy with theology. No, Thomas understands that in his Summa, he is doing revealed theology. Thomas just has a Christian understanding of philosophy as serving as a handmaiden to theology. So Thomas can use Aristotle where he's helpful and disagree with him where he obviously disagrees. You know, Aristotle being a pagan, not being a Christian, um, there are obviously going to be places where we disagree with Aristotle. And, you know, there's times where the reform do. Um, but since Aristotle's categories um, are helpful and clear, and especially when we're doing revealed theology, we want to be precise, right? Especially since we're doing theology for the church, right? We do theology for the church, whether it's for our seminary students <coughs> and we're writing a, you know, formal systematic theology, or, you know, it's a commentary, you know. We're doing theology in a precise way so that it's beneficial for the church. Um, and that's why I believe Aristotle's used is because the distinctions that he makes in his philosophical works are clear. Um, obviously, and this is something that I actually wrote a paper on, 
on the use of Aristotelianism in uh, Dutch Reformed Orthodoxy. I'm looking at three specific theologians. One of them that I mentioned, Petrus van Maastricht, um, um, Antonius Drissen, and Heisbertus Vutius, and just their use of Aristotelianism in each, you know, in, in all of their treatment, especially in regards to the late, the latter end of the 17th century with the rise of Cartesianism. Um, you know, I believe with Vutius, Maastricht, and Drissen that Cartesianism is the departure from the old way of doing philosophy and epistemology. Um, so the reason why Aristotle is used and not, you know, Descartes, not Hegel, not Kant, is because, you know, I believe that these guys depart from an Aristotelian understanding. Um, and obviously the Reformed tradition, you know, coming, you know, in reception of just the great theological tradition that the high medievals have to offer, they're going to model after their predecessors. They're going to see Thomas quoting the, you know, thus the, you know, the philosopher says here. Um, they're going to see Lombard, you know, Scotus, etc. cetera. Um, and they're going to use Aristotle in a helpful way to do theology in a precise manner. I think it's just important to say um, in general, like if I'm, if I'm a Christian at home, right? Like the question is, well, why, why do I need to use any philosopher when it, or any philosophy when I approach doing theology or when I approach my Bible? I think something that was really big for me understanding is, is that everybody has a philosophy, whether they realize it or not. So if you're born in the 21st century in the United States, whether you realize it or not, you probably have a modernist philosophy. That sounds a lot more like Descartes. It's more skeptic. Um, and it's probably more materialist and more secular than uh, the philosophy of um, those before us. So, uh, for example, right, if I'm a modernist um, and I approach the Bible and I read something like, you know, um, let's just use Paul, an example of uh, the sacraments, right? So I get to 1 Corinthians 10 and I read that the, 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 bo the body of Christ, sorry, the, the bread that we break is not a participation in the body of Christ. Well, right, well, for me as a modernist, the idea that God communicates a spiritual reality through a physical thing, that doesn't make sense to me. I reject that mm -hmm. and be like, no, it's simply merely a symbol of Christ's body. It's not it's mm -hmm. actually communicate Christ's body to me. That's because they because we, we we assume a modernist philosophy. So mm -hmm. the question is, um, what philosophy, what um manner of thinking gives us clearer categories to organize our thoughts about God? Right, we read truths in scripture. Truth, scripture gives us propositions like God is good, God is one, God is love, um, man is sinful. Like, so we, it gives us propositions and truths about God, and theology is organizing those truths, right? But when it comes to how we organize those things and talk about those things, we have to think about um, what philosophy is most compatible with scripture and allows us to faithfully organize those things. And if you look at the early church, what what does the early church do? Does the early church say, we need no philosophy. We just need we just need to read the Bible. Uh, no, they realize that we need to be able to properly think when we approach the Bible. So um, Plato was, you know, Platonic philosophy was a philosophy that was used very on in the early church. Um, and it's less precise than Aristotle because Plato didn't have the same categories. Um, mm -hmm. When you read Augustine, Augustine's a Platonic guy, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the great Christian tradition has always utilized philosophy as an aid, as a help for us to organize our thoughts in the way we think. Um, and even like when you approach the text of scripture, I mean, putting scripture in its, in its historical context, right? Like Paul was a Hellenized Jew that knew Greek and that was familiar with Greek philosophers. And so when he goes, you know, into the book of Acts and he meets Greek people, he's able to use philosophy but organize his thoughts and point people to God. Even in Romans 1, Romans 1, a great um, a, a, a great high point of, of, of Paul's theology, you see a bit of a hint of a little platonic philosophy come out, right? So if you read, mm -hmm. uh, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, the things that have been made, so they without excuse. So Paul reasons that from the created things, we're able to reason up and point us to the highest thing, which is God's invisible divine attributes. 
So you even see there in Paul, like Paul is using philosophy, using a way of thinking to think about the world and how the whole world points, if reason just points to there's a God and, is, and he's just and his visible attributes. And that's enough to render all men uh, without excuse. So everybody has a philosophy. The question is, do you have a bad one or do you have a good one? And you need to make sure you have a good one. You need to make sure your first principles about how to think about God are laid out before you start doing theology. And Josh, is that what prolegomena is? That is what prolegomena is. I was going to mention, you do have that one guy, Tertullian, who says, what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens? Tertullian Um, was also, Tertullian was weird, man. We all know he was weird. Yeah, he was weird, right? You know, I think think that's very reflective of, you know, Tertullian's great, right? You know, he's the one that, you know, codify the word Trinitas, but there are still errors, right? Um, so he's great, but he's weird. Yeah, he's so, great, Josh, but he's weird. One one question I'd have, um, sure, is uh, you went with more of Augustine's. So not more Augustine. We kind of went more with Augustine's definition of theology, right? Being like mm-hmm. wisdom pertaining to divine things. So why Augustine's yeah. definition over Van Ma- Maastricht? Because I love Van Maastricht's. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. Living to God in Christ. You know, I, I, I love what Maastricht is doing in his theoretical practical theology, like, especially me being Dutch reformed, you know, all the guys that I mentioned, you know, taught at Dutch universities. So it shows my bias. Um, now, I think the reason why it shows Augustine and just the traditional, you know, phrase or definition that's given, you know, Unius, he says that theology is, you know, wisdom concerning divine matters. Um, and Augustine says, that, you know, the same thing, because Unius is building on Augustine. I think the reason why I say that is because it's the definition that I've seen most frequently, right, in the four book, well, except for Maastricht, but in, no, well, in Unius, in Augustine, City of God, in Thomas's um, article on sacred doctrine, and Johannes Polyander's disputation on no sacred theology, they say that theology is wisdom concerning divine matters, um, and it's very yeah, there's there's a relationship between Francis Unius's treatise and Polyander's disputation, um, but I, I do love Maastricht's definition. Um, it's a definition that definitely, if somebody is going to ask me. Um, it's definitely something that I would say, um, but there's no hatred for Ames or Maastricht. I love them. They're great. Um, their works should be read. I think the reason why I tend with the Augustinian definition is because it's the definition that I've seen frequently. I've seen it a lot. Um, and yeah, I was also going to mention something that, uh, so just depending on who you're reading, um, I would say that, and this is something that Master even acknowledges in his prolegomena on the distinctions between Thomistic understandings of prolegomena and Scotus understandings of prolegomena. Um, Maastricht, especially, you can tell that he has a more Scotus leaning in his definition of theology, right? It's the art of living to God through Christ. And, you know, and the reason why Scotus believed that, theor- that theology was, a, was a, <clears throat> a practical habit is because same thing with Thomas, you know, what does what does vision consist of? For Scotus, it's enjoyment. For Thomas, it's um, it's knowledge. And and this is high medieval, you know, discussions, but you know, I just side with what Turretin says that vision does not only consist of knowledge, it also consists of enjoyment. But um, so I think Maastricht and Ames have a more Scotus leaning on their definition of theology, but they're still going to use Thomas where he's helpful. And, you know, we cannot properly say, I think I was talking to you about this, Jonathan, last Saturday, that the Reformed are neither Thomas or Scotus. They're just Reformed. They're eclectic. They're going to use their high medieval sources in the areas that they are helpful and depart from them from the areas that, that they are not. But that's why I tend with Augustine's definition. It's the more frequent definition that I've seen. Well, guys, I think uh, we're going to start wrapping up now josh i think it'd be a really good uh, to come back and maybe do an episode on how uh reformed prolegomena differs from roman catholic prolegomena and luther yeah. prolegomena and some other prolegomenas i think we can have uh probably a few more discussions just on this issue and maybe unpacking 
um, those big sections of prolegomena, right? Um, yeah. And that'd be that'd be a fun conversation to do. Maybe a few more episodes on different aspects of prolegomena, um, and maybe yeah, give us pra- more practical examples of how we can do that. So we should definitely come back to. Um, so as we wrap up, Matthew, you're going to be our our main presenter next week. What are you going to be presenting on? Uh, <clears throat> I am going to be the main presenter next week. And primarily what I wanted to focus on was the topic of baptismal efficacy. Um, primarily, I thought this was funny, among the Reformed Italian divines. So the reason I just think it's a unique topic is because, you know, when you think of Italians in regard to religion, what do you think of? You think of Roman Catholics, but many of our great actual Reformed divines, Peter Martyr Vermigli, that's my boy, uh, Turretin, you think of Zanchi, they were all Italian men. And I've spent a lot of time reading all of them on primarily on baptism and the sacraments. And I think that they have a very um, interesting view of baptism. And what I want to do is I wanted to break down their view of baptism and baptismal efficacy um, related to, to some of our other reform conf- confessions, specifically the Westminster Confession of Faith, and then also try and connect it with, uh, try and see if I can bring something from John Davenant in as well, talk about his view, because he has a very uh, notorious view among the reformed world that's very interesting. So I thought it'd be very nice to go through him. And then also, I wanted to take their views and try and present a, a Catholic case for it, lowercase c, and talk about the fathers and how they present baptism, because, you know, with a lot of people, you have somebody who watches a Jordan Cooper video. He's like, oh, baptismal regeneration, the universal view of the fathers. And, you know, and in a sense, yes, no. So I wanted to elaborate on that and go through um, just the baptismal efficacy among the uh, reformed divines stemming from Italy. Dude, yeah. We're looking forward to it. So uh, as we wrap up, I just want to do, let's just, I'd love for all of us to go through quick and just kind of talk about what we're reading right now uh, for class and maybe uh, a work we read here in the last week that's really stuck out to us. Um, so while y'all think about that, I'm going to go first. Um, we just read for a theology and ministry, uh, Martin Bucer's On the True Care of Souls. Uh, it's kind of Martin Bucer's uh, manual when he was in Strasbourg for how to do pastoral care. Uh, what I thought was super interesting about it is he gave his uh, kind of his defense of his reform polity. And his reform polity was really neither uh, Presbyterian nor Episcopal. Uh, so he laid out that in, in God's church, God established two offices, uh, deacon and then pastor elder bishop, which is all one office. And he argues that, well, pastor elder bishops, they all administer sacraments and they all preach. And when they gather in courts, they should choose one of them to preside the court. And that's the that's the overseer bishop. So he kind of has this, we, this interesting um, quality where it's not quite Presbyterian, but it's not quite Episcopal. Um and as a more low church leaning Anglican, I, I really appreciated it. Um, I, you know, I'm very Bootsarian and I, I loved it. Matthew, what have you been reading? Um, I didn't actually know we were going to be doing this. I kind of forgot about this. So I would have had the books out, but I just today I just finished reading um, Hans Boersma's Scripture as Real Presence. And I really enjoyed it. Boersma is a great scholar, a great theologian, and he just. It, it didn't even seem like he was trying to give a way to like read script. It was more like he was just presenting the, the view of the fathers and how they interpreted scripture about how, you know, it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word is Christ. He's the eternal Logos. So likewise, when you have, when you have scripture, this is the word of God. And so because of that, Christ is going to be sacramentally present in the word and he's going to be present in the old Testament. So then he presents a way that how to do allegorical readings of the old Testament, you know, as like, you know, a Protestant, I get a little bit antsy going there, but actually it's a a big comfort. uh, Once you're able to like, you know, start getting like when you read the reformers on it, like I was just reading today, um, second Samuel chapter nine. And all of a sudden I'm just like, this is type typological about, Christ. And uh, I decided to consult my uh, patristic uh, commentaries. My, and funny enough, none of them said anything about it. But when I went to Matthew Henry, he actually pointed out an allegorical or Christological reading of it. And I thought that was so funny. So I felt a little more comfortable using Boer's I didn't feel like I was LARPing as a, a non-Protestant person doing it. So he was really good. And in regard to fiction, I'm finishing up that hideous strength right now from C.S. Lewis. And I hope to start Dostoevsky after that, his brother's camera is up. And yeah. Dude, sick. 
Josh, what are you reading? So um, I guess not necessarily in preparation uh, to this podcast, but um, something and Turretin um, quotes him and then also the Leiden synopsis quotes him as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if other reformed prolegomenons um, that I was not able to get into. I want to touch on Amanda's Polonis syntagma, but that's around different not another time. Um, but Cicero on the nature of the gods um, was a classical natural the, um, you know, theological text. Um, Turretin quotes him in his prolegomena and also um, the authors of the line of synopsis quote Cicero as well in the nature of the gods in defense of the existence of God. So I've enjoyed it so far. Um, loving Cicero. Um, Got to get into more Cicero. Got to get into more classical literature. And yeah, but also Maastricht's volume two, we're reading it for Doctrine of God. Um, we just finished, I think, The Affections and Will of God. It's um, not so hard. Yeah. It's so good, man. It's just, it's so good. Everything that you need to know about will you know the will of god affections it was really really good on divine affections especially in light of all these divine simplicity issues that are arising in our modern days um just very very helpful on you know creaturely predications to god you know emotions predicated to god just very very helpful and very very practical so by maastricht by volume three as well awesome jordan i know what you're reading it's the what same guy you're always reading oh yeah well I'm reading uh, some other guys now, <laughs> if you okay. want to know about it. But uh, yeah, I've uh, recently, so on top of just, I've been reading um, John Owen's uh, Sacramental Discourses. He has like 25 of them, I think. Uh, just little preparations. Those are good. And little, those, are, yeah. those are really good. Sorry to interrupt, but I actually use like, and I wrote a letter to our um, session uh, requesting weekly communion. And in that, I gave a quote from him. And like, when you hear Puritan, sometimes people just think low sacramentology, but he is like, He's yeah. so good. Sorry, sorry to yeah. interrupt. I just had it's to say, yeah. read it. It's good. <laughs> yeah, he has a lot of good stuff on like uh, preparation for the Lord's Supper. It's great. And um, but um, as well as that, I I've been uh recently falling in love with just like the Mercersburg's theolo Mercersburg theologians. And so like I have been uh reading Philip Schaff, his History of the Christian Church, and his um Principle of Protestantism. And he's a he's basically just a historian but he's uh he also has a um i'm pretty sure he has a high uh sacramental view similar to nevin but um yeah his his whole stuff on just germany being this like fertile country ready for the reformation is so good and so um there's that and just um also he has a little little book i got on lagos on the progress of uh, religious freedom and like the edicts of religious freedom throughout history. It's a, he, he's a great historian. So, um, so yeah, just the Mercersburg, uh, theologians and, uh, John Owen. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, thank uh, you for joining us on this episode of the Irenic Protestant podcast. If you enjoyed it, uh, we'd really appreciate it. with the five-star review on iTunes or Spotify for us. Uh, and it helps us, you know, reach more listeners and get them on that journey towards classical and confessional Protestantism. Uh, if you are watching us on YouTube, please make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, let us know what you thought. Um, hey, if Jonathan, you did it, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, if you feel like answering now. Nah, we'll get we'll answer no? that later. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll answer that later. <laughs> Just if you, you didn't want to put it on your mind. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. We'll we'll answer that later. Um, if you didn't what enjoy was the it question? though. What are the Dutch Reformed distinctives compared to other Reformed traditions? Yeah, we'll answer hey. that later. <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 hey, Christian Mario, we'll, we'll, we'll send, we'll have, we'll have Josh send an email about it. Okay. So, but guys, Discord. if you if you didn't enjoy this episode, uh, you should just go check out the Pilgrim Faith podcast. You'll probably that enjoy that yeah. one more. And uh, yeah. we'll see you next time on the Irenic Protestant podcast. Bye, guys. See ya. Peace out.